I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. Thank you for coming out personally to show your presence on the behalf of Yeshivas Nefesh David annual parlor meeting. I first want to say to thank you, Zwaiju, a special thank you to Babrumi and Mrs. Heller for hosting the parlor meeting for the 11th year in their home. I also want to say a special thank you to Dr. Michael Sutton here on my left for volunteering tirelessly again and again on our behalf. Thank you. I also want to thank everyone for coming. We'd like to start off with a video presentation of the day-to-day -day life of the yeshiva. the yeshiva at the beginning of the year, I've seen an amazing change in my life. I want to thank the yeshiva for being such a great yeshiva, an amazing place, for doing everything for us and all of the programs we have, an amazing place. Thank you very much. To move on to hear a personal experience from a bacha of Yeshiva Nefesh David to share some of his thoughts with us. Daniel Malka from Yerushalayim, Eretz Yisrael. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with all of you this evening. Many of you know who I am, but for those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Malka. I'm from Eretz Yisrael, from Yerushalayim. I was fortunate to be a former student of Yeshiva Nefesh David. I graduated four years ago. I'm sure many of you know or are thinking 
If he graduated four years ago, what is he still doing here? The answer is simple. I graduated and I returned to Eretz Yisrael, where I continued my learning at Kail Meisen Nisim, a morning Kail run by another Yeshiva Snefesh David alumnus. After a year, I realized I missed the Yeshiva Snefesh David environment. And I approached Rabbi Kakun to inquire if there was a supervisory position for me. Luckily there was. I returned to Toronto and I became a dorm supervisor. And I have been here for two years now. Why did I come back to Toronto to Yeshiva Snefesh David? I was very interested in developing my management and my leadership skills. I have developed a variety of problems and solving skills and have learned that being a good leader and manager is challenging, requiring strong negotiation skills in guiding others without conflict. I arrived here with my twin brother at the age of 13. Our parents wanted us to continue our yeshiva education. Yeshiva's Nefesh David could provide that, and it did. Not only did I get fantastic learning in Kail and Chaydesh studies education, but with the mentorship from Rabbi Kakun and all the other incredible teachers here, I learned to become a confident speaker within the Jewish deaf community. Currently, I produce a weekly parasha video accessible on social media explaining the parasha both in American Sign Language and Israeli Sign Language. That's a different language. Many viewers are in touch with me thanking me for how much they are now able to learn from these videos. This experience allows me to share my Jewish values with others who may have not had the opportunity to learn Torah like I did at Yeshiva Snefesh David. Next year, I plan to go back to Eretz Yisrael to begin studying accounting. However, Yeshiva Snefesh David will always remain in my heart and soul. There is no doubt in my mind that without having had this exceptional opportunity to study here for five years, <coughs> I would have not been capable and successful person that I am today. Yeshiva Snefesh David changes lives for the better. And I can vouch for that because that has changed my own life. I must thank Hashem for giving me this experience that will stay with me always. I want to emphasize that all I have been doing for others is actually because of this Toronto community. After all, most of you do not have a hearing loss, and yet go out of your way to support us. This has made me realize how much more I must and I can do to give back. To give back to the deaf community. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your inspiring message. We shouldn't let you leave. My own Akara Sataiv goes to Rabbi Kakun, a special Akara Sataiv, for allowing me to start my day the Torah way. Every day, rain or shine or snow, six o'clock in the morning, and there's a morning coil gives me the opportunity to learn with him, the Chavosa. It's my deepest Akarasa type. So I want to thank Rabbi Kakun. Special thank you. And introduce Rabbi Kakun to introduce our guest speaker of Pesach Kron to say a few words. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and the malady has harmed us. This year, we have the success of having a proper stubborn idea, but thank the Lord has a very easy receiver. Has a past time, but I had to hear his house to accept. But I had them. I have thought back, but I didn't hear feeling, but I nothing has to seem. And what about Jacob and Lago? For their investment in how time with them is speak to what I felt. Mr. Mr. Hello. Your continual support for his service never stopping and opening your home to us all for the annual event is truly remarkable. Following when his well battles craft, we have no words to convey the depth of the error his commitment to us. Thank you. Tonight, then we'll mark a his thoughts with us. We will miss Daniel when he leaves never stopping. I am most proud of Daniel. I got so much hard to keep never stopping going so that the other Bahrain can have the same ability like him. During this summer, we make an actor effort to be together with our speech and work and improving our relationships systems with others. The care to see how we know that the Torah Use the term nega for affection due to speaking Lothar Hoa. The term hornic for pleasure has the same letters as nega. Moreover, the letter hain is has the beginning and is the Hebrew word for high. We learn a lesson here that the way we deal with our talent is dependent on how we perceive things. If we feel dollars, have others, and do not learn how to use our hands properly to help us out what we have observed and how we look at what others have. We may only continue to be consumed with envy and have no religious nervous. But with the right perspective and a perspective for who we are, we can consistently have our neck to pleasure in our lives. Bob Yakum Kaffelman has two laws as well. So, an interesting part that we can minimize the use of loss and horror through our next stamps with mirrors and the voice to our heart to stab us table. But the only thing with heavy loss, thus, attempts at seeking. The mirror is usually half key, and the bad not always so appealing. I tell my Bahrain that yet it is only a matter of perspective. The fact that we can occupy our time is that with the very tower has done it. Um, the game, especially Bachelor Suda, as we sit around together and has a stand his tether, is something not to be taken for granted. 
Та вкарен, прям в ту раз, раз, та бахлием, фия, мера, мас, кенатен, ту, та, 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 It is such a great schus to be able to participate in this Helege Yeshiva. If you would have been with me today in the Yeshiva, I see this tzaddik over here and other tzaddikim, the boys. Could we have the lights on because I can't see my notes? So to speak in front of them and see this tzaddik here, he was the one who interpreted for everyone. And I want to share with you something that I told them that I feel is the essence of why we came here tonight. I knew that I had only about 10 or 15 minutes to speak to the boys. And I wanted to tell them something that I felt would be very memorable. And that was an Indian of tefillah. After all, everybody spends a tremendous amount of time in tefillah every day. And the maral asks a question, what is the origin of the word tefillah? Where does it come from? What does it mean? And he says something remarkable. We all remember the dramatic moment when Yaakov Avinu saw his son Yosef after what he thought was 22 years that his son was not alive. And the Pasik uses this expression. Yaakov says, Ro'oi fanecha loy filolti. What does filolti mean, Dr. Ashi? I never had a thought. It never even occurred to me in my thinking process that I would see you. Zok de Heilige Maral, filolti is tefillah. That's what tefillah is, a thought process. And that when you are speaking, when you're davening, it's not just a question of saying words, but rather thinking of what you're saying. And just like when I'm talking to you right now, I'm thinking of every word that I'm saying. When you're talking and davening to Hashem, it's a conversation. It's not just verbal communication. It's a thought process. And then I told them, how important it is to have your own siddur and to underline words and expressions that you have heard a pshat on so that every day your siddur talks to you. If you go into a shul, the aguda, or wherever you daven, and you take a siddur off the shelf and you're davening at 80 miles an hour, you're not concentrating, and you can't possibly be thinking of every word. But if you have your own siddur, as I showed the boys afterwards, 
and you can underline certain choice expressions that you have heard something about, then every day that sitter is talking to you. And I want to give you one example that I told them that I feel is appropriate not only for Nefesh David, but for every single one of us. During the Second World War, the Skalena Rebbe, Rebbe Yeza Zisha, Portugal, in Romania, did a tremendous thing. He harbored in his home more than 400, 400 different boys and girls at different times, at different times to save them from going to the army, from being among the Goyim, from going to concentration camps. And he and his wife would take care of these children, obviously not all at the same time, but throughout the war there were 400 different kids that were there. And one day somebody snitched on the Rebbe and went to the authorities and said that the Rebbe's heart hiding these kids. And of course, the police were only too happy to come to the Rebbe to see if it was true, and they saw that it was true. So they took the Rebbe, and they put him in jail in solitary confinement. And they told him that he's going to rot there until he dies. And they took away his yarmulke, and they took away his glasses, and they left him there. Now, they say that before the Rebbe got in jail, there are some people who say that it would take him Shemay Nesra every single day, if you could believe it, more than an hour. Because he concentrated on every single word. But now that he was in jail and he was going to be there until he died, he could dive in even slower than that. Because otherwise, what was he doing there, right? So he, how could he dive in? He had no yarmulke. He took his jacket. He put it over his head. And he started davening. And of course, he knew the davening bal And in one of the first days that he was there, he started saying, Baruch Sha'omar. And as he was saying, Baruch Sha'omar, suddenly he had a question, and he got so angry at himself, how in the world could he never have had this question before? He had been davening all these years. How could he not have this question? And the question, when you think about it, is something that should have bothered us all these years. Every single expression in Baruch Sha'amar is positive. Some good thing that the Eivishter does. Merachim ala Oretz, Merachim ala Briyais, Mishalim Sochotev L'Reyav. Everything, wonderful things that the Eivishter does. And all of a sudden, in the middle of everything, we say, Baruch, the Eivishter is blessed. Goizer umakayim. Goizer means he makes him a gzeira. Umakayim, and he fulfills it. That's a terrible thing. Now, it's true. Sometimes David has to make a gzera for whatever reason. That's his cheshben. But how does that fit in with Baruch Sha'amar? The whole Baruch Sha'amar is positive. And he kept on saying it over Baruch Goizu Makayim, Baruch Goizu Makayim. And he said, Rabbi Nishalom, do not let me get out of this place until I figure this out because it bothers me. How come I never thought about this before? And then finally, all of a sudden, he came up with a tremendous pshat. And the pshat was so exhilarating and so encouraging, and it should encourage us every single day of our lives from tomorrow morning on. And I showed the boys in my own siddur how I have it underlined, and tonight before you go to sleep, underline it in your own siddur, Baruch Goizah Mokayim, the men and the women, anybody who has their own siddur. You know what he touched it? He said, O Mokayim doesn't only mean to fulfill. Baruch Goiza Makayim, David Shem makes a and he fulfills it. But Umakayim comes from the word Kiyum, to have an existence. Baruch, the Eivish is gebenched because sometimes he has to make a gzera. But don't worry, hang in there. Umakayim, he gives you the, ko the koyach to exist through this difficult gzera. That's why it's a positive thing. That's what the wonderful thing about this expression is. And the way that I know this story is because a few days later, after he thought of this pshat, they took him out of jail. He said himself that he knew once he thought of that pshat, he's going to get out of there. And every year in Brooklyn, he would make a uh, suda saidur on the day that he got out of that jail. And I have a cousin who's already in the oil of my MS Kalman driven. He was a shtikol skalana chosid. He would go all the time to that suda. And every year the Rebbe said this over. And this is something that we should also take in our lives. Baruch Goizer Mokayim. We all go through challenges. Nobody gets away scot-free. And I said to the boys, Nefesh David 
is Baruch Goyzer Makayim. Imagine all the hundreds of Talmidim that have gone through Nefesh Dovid over the years, in the last 18 years. Surely every single parent, when they realized that their child is hearing impaired, they felt, Rabbi what an awful, awful gzeira. My child is imperfect. How will he ever learn Torah? How will he ever be like a regular child? How will he ever smile among a group of children? But Goizer, the Ebishter, made a gzeira for whatever reason, or Makayim. But he gave them a way to exist. He gave them Rab Chaim Tzvi Kakun and his Rebbe and Libby. He gave them the Yeshivas Nefesh David and Rabbi Erlanger and all the other wonderful Rabbeim, Rabbi Inglis, all these wonderful people that are part of that school. That's the Geyser Omakayim. And that's what we come here tonight for. To give Kiyom, to give existence to these boys. Talk to them. Play with them. Have a conversation. Learn with them. And you'll see how happy they are. Look at the smile on this kid's face. Look at that, right? Or on this boy's face right here. Right? Like any other child in the world. Why? Because of Nefesh Yavid. That's Baruch Goyza Mokayim. But tonight we've come here in the time of Sphira. And the Slonim Rebbe, the Nasiva Shalom, says something absolutely incredible. And he says that how does the Torah introduce to us the mitzvah of Sphira? By these words, Usafartem Lochem. And it's amazing what he comes up with this word, Usfartem Lachem, the way he writes in the Siva Shalom, he says, Usafartem doesn't only mean counting, but he says it comes from the Lushan Evan Sapir. You have to become a sapphire. You have to become a diamond. Usfartem Lachem, not only that you count, Usfartem, each one of us during these 49 days of sphere, it has to become an emerald, a diamond, a sapphire. We have to improve ourselves as we go towards Shavuos and Kabbalah Satayra. And he writes, of course, we see that we count 1 to 49. We don't count 49 down to 1. If I told you that you won a lottery in 50 days, you wouldn't count 1 to 50. You'd count 50 all the way down to 1. How many days until you get the lottery? But Shavuos, it's not that way. Shavuos, it's we're trying to get higher and higher. And we have to polish ourselves and we have to brighten ourselves and illuminate ourselves. And how are we going to do this? And so tonight I want to show you two ways. How every single one of us in these days of Sphira can improve ourselves. I want to talk about two specific topics. The first topic is about achieving goals. Now, when we look at what Nefesh David and Rab Chaim Tzvi and his staff have done, they've achieved a tremendous, tremendous goal. And we here in Toronto have to look at this yeshiva as being a role model of what we have to be able to accomplish in life. Everybody has goals. Everybody should have goals. But how do you accomplish the goal? How was Rab Chaim Tzvi able to do that? How was the staff able to do that? So I'll tell you something amazing. I remember one year at an Aguda convention, Rab Chanoich Erentroy, Dayan Erentroy came to be the guest speaker. It was Mota Shabbos, it was very, very late. And of course he realized that he couldn't give a very long speech. It was after midnight by the time he started. But he said one vart, and that vart was so extraordinary that every time we see each other, and I've spoken in a shul numerous times in Hendon. We went to Bournemouth. We were a whole Shabbos with the shul. We always chazer over this vort. Because this is the essence of what accomplishment is all about. And he said like this from the Shei Mishmoel. The Pasuk tells us, Vahi kasha yolda Rochel es Yosef. When Rochel gave birth to Yosef, Vayemi Yaakov el Lovon. Yaakov says to Lovon, oh, now that's it. I've got a son like Yosef, Shalcheni, Ve'elcha, El Makoim, Ilaratzi. Now I can face the world. So the Shem Shmuel asked a question. Just because he had Yosef, what do you mean? He had Yehuda. Yehuda, all the Jewish kings were going to come from Yehuda. He had Yisocha. All the Tamir Chachamim came from Yisocha. All the Kahnim and Levim came from Levi. The Rebbeim came from Shimon. What's so special about Yosef? And the Shem Shmuel says, you know what it has to do? It has to do with the name. Yosef means to always want more. 
never to be satisfied with the status quo. No matter what level you're at, always to want to steig hecher, always to want to go higher. And that's how you accomplish. And that's what Yaakov Avinu said. Once I have a son that I know that will never be satisfied with the status quo, will always try to go higher, that's how I'm going to reach the goals, and that's how I can face the world. And that's the first lesson in goals. The first lesson is never to be satisfied with where you're at in life. Always strive higher. And that's what Nefesh David has started. That's how they started 18 years ago. Every year, more and more technology. Every year, more and more different ways to teach the students, to connect to the students. And that's why a Talmud wants to come back, because he wants that influence, that inspiration of always going higher. I'll tell you something. When we go to Mir, I mean the town of Mir in Poland, and we're at the cave of Rabbi Yerucham, I always tell them what Rabbi Yerucham Lovavitz said. It's a very important mida for all of us to know. Rabbi Yerucham once said, woe is to the person who doesn't recognize his faults, for he doesn't know what he could repair. Everybody, we have to know our faults so we know what we should have to repair. However, what he writes is worse is the one who doesn't know his milus and his attributes, for then he doesn't know what he could accomplish. Every one of us is always criticizing ourselves about our faults. But really, if you want to accomplish things, you have to look at your milus. Every one of us has milus. Rabbi Chaim Tzvi's father in Denver, Colorado, could have given up many, many times and said, listen, my son will never be a Talmud Chacham. There's no school for him in Denver. He has to go in a public school. How in the world could this kid ever be a Talmud Chacham? But he didn't give up. He sent him to camp. He sent him to Ne Israel. Normie Lowenthal, a dear friend of mine, was his Chavrusa. And others became his Chavrusa. And he became a Talmud Chacham. You know why? Because the cocoons always focus on what they can accomplish, not what they can't accomplish. And when you focus in your own life of what you can accomplish, then you're going to be able to reach your goals. Now, I want to tell you an amazing story. This story was told by Rab Shlomer Freifeld. Many of you certainly heard the name. One of the fathers of the Balchuva movement, Yeshiva Shar Yoshev. And he wrote, he told over many speeches, and there's a great Talmud Chacham in Lakewood, Rab Yosef Ryman, who wrote over the speeches of Rabbi Freifeld. And the book is called In Search of Greatness. And he tells this story. He tells the story the first time that he went to see the Chazaynish. Rav Freifeld was a young man. It was the early 1950s. And he writes, he was so intimidated to be in front of the Chazaynish that he could not say a word. He couldn't talk because the Chazaynish was the God Ladar. How could he talk? But he said that I didn't talk, but the Chazaynish spoke to me. And what the Chazonish told Rabbi Freifeld lasted with him for the rest of his life. And he said to him like this. He said, I want you to know, the Chazonish said, that many of those people that became G'doyle Hadar, the greatest G'doylem, the greatest Talmud Chachamim, they were not geniuses. They had to work very hard to reach where they were. Some of them were wonder children, but some of them were not. And he gave three examples. It's amazing. All the Talmud HaChomim here will recognize these names. And to me, the first time I heard these three names, I was so shocked that it was either the Chazaynish or Rabbi Shlomo Freifeld, Rabbi Yaakov Ryman couldn't remember, even when he listened to the, seat, to the cassettes again, whose marshal it was. Was it the Chazaynish who said these three or the Rabbi Freifeld said these three? But either one, either way, it was the Nitziv, the Ketzois, and Rabbi Yitzchak Ochon and Spectre. Could you imagine the Kovner Rav? These three, they were not geniuses. And yet they became G'daylem. How did they become G'daylem? And Rav Freifeld said, because you've got to have the four Ds. And try to write this down and try to remember these four Ds, because this is how you accomplish a goal. No matter what your goal in life is, you've got to have desire. You've got to have dedication. You have to have drive and determination. Those four Ds. If you have desire, dedication, drive, and determination, then you're going to accomplish your goal. That's what Rabbi Freifeld says. 
And it's not easy to accomplish your goals. You have to know, as Rabbi Yerucham said, what your milas are. You have to be, as the Shem Yishmol says, Yosef, always striving higher. And to have these four Ds. Now, I want to show you an amazing thing. And the reason that I love this thing is because this is a Pasuk that you would think nothing can be learned from this Pasuk. And yet, the Chavetz Chaim makes a life message out of it. The Pasuk tells us in Lech Lecha, Vayetzu loleches arzo kenan. Avram Avinu went to go to Canaan, Vayavoyu arzo kenan, and he came to Canaan. What, why does the Torah tell us that? What could we learn from this? He decided to go to Canaan, and he got to Canaan. Zok to Chavetz Chaim, there's a great lesson here. Let's go back to Parshish Noyach, and we're going to see what happened with Terach. Terach takes his son Avram, he takes Lloyd, his nephew, and he takes Sarai, his daughter-in-law. They were going to go to Canaan. They came to Choron. And they sat in Choron. And that's where they lived. What are you talking about? You were supposed to get to Canaan. What does that mean? That's like somebody saying, I'm going to go from Toronto to New York and you end up at Niagara Falls and you move into Niagara Falls. You were supposed to go to New York. What happened? You didn't make it there. Zog to Chovetz Chaim. Shalo Adam lo leches bedarkei Avram Avinu. A person has to go like Avram. In Mekabel al Atzmai lo leches arzu Kanan. If you decide to go to Kanan, muhachu leilech lasem. You got to get there. Vloy l'shanois mehalchoy early shor beim tzaderuch. You can't stop and switch mid course. When we come during Aser during this Yemei Sfira. We have to think, how are we going to improve ourselves? We can't be lazy. We can't be lazy. We have to look at our milas. We have to be safe. We have to go more. We have to have those four Ds. Desire, dedication, drive, and determination. And if you decide to get someplace, you decide to do something, you've got to do it. Not that you're going to stop in the middle. And so I just want to tell you one more vart about reaching goals and a story, and then we'll go to the second part of the talk. One of my favorite verta ever is something from Rav Hutner, and only Rav Hutner could come up with this. The Pasik tells us, Vayar elekim as kol asher osa, the Ebishah saw everything that he did, v'hinei toiv ma'oid, and it was very good. Zok de medrish ma'oid is Adam, mem alav dalad, alav dalad mem. So, Rav Hutner asks, why does the Medrash have to tell us that? Any child can look at the letters, Mem Alav Dalad, and he sees it's Alav Dalad Mem. What are we teaching here? And listen to what Rav Hutner says. He says, everything in life can be measured. The distance between here and the sun can be measured. The distance between here and the bottom of the ocean can be measured. The only thing that can't be measured is the potential in man. Adam is ma'oid. You know why we don't accomplish things, each and every one of us? And only 8% of mankind fulfills their own potential because we don't believe in ourselves. The Tzitka Satsadik says there's three things you have to believe in. You have to believe in Hashem, you have to believe in Torah, and you have to believe in yourself. And when you believe in yourself, you can build a yeshiva like Nefesh David. And when you believe in yourself, you can accomplish anything. This is a young community. There's so many things that you could accomplish in life. Don't let life pass you by and then just live a comfortable life. Make a goal and get to it. And I'll end this segment of the talk with a fabulous story that happened with Rabbi Moshe Shera. We all know that Rabbi Moshe Shera was one of the greatest askanim in our generation, the head of Agudas Yisrael. And in 1998, in May of 1998, he was dying. He was very sick. And the 76th dinner of Agurus Yisrael was going to be on a Sunday night. And he knew that if he only could live to that dinner, he would give his final speech. That would be the last speech he would ever give. He knew that. But he didn't think he was going to make it. And so he didn't bother preparing the speech. But then a week before the speech, the doctor came into his room and said, Rabbi Shari, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You should prepare that speech. And Rabbi Shari believed him. And he started preparing the speech. And in his shaky handwriting, he started writing what he thought he would be able to deliver. He finished writing the speech, but tragically, Sunday morning, he passed away. 
and he never got a chance to give that speech. He died that morning, and of course, his son, Shimshi Shera, for the rest of the year, was giving many, many speeches about his father. Now, my father, Allah Shalom, and Rabbi Shera learned in Ne'er Yisrael together. Same time, Yabod L'chaim as Rabbi Shmuel Kamenetsky. And what happened was, Rabbi Shera was always very friendly to me because of that. He knew that my father had died young, and he was always careful, always to ask about my mother. He was extremely sensitive. So, Shimshi Shera said to me, look, my father liked you. Why don't you give, you have to speak at a shleishim, at a 30-day memorial service. Why don't you give his final speech? I said, me, Shimshi, why don't you give it? He said, no, I have plenty to say. So here's his final speech. This thought, listen to this. The Torah tells us, and as we prepare for Hasina, we should think about this. You should surround the nation around Harsinai, make a circle. Be careful not to go up on the mountain. If you touch that mountain, anybody who touches that mountain, he's going to die. In other words, Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, make a circle around Harsinai, make a demarcation. Nobody should pass that line. Anybody who touches the mountain, they're going to die. That's the simple meaning. But Rabbi Shera said, you know how the Kotzka Rebbe understood it? He understood it a totally different way. And he understood it the following way. And he said like this, Bederach Drush. He said, sometimes in life, a person has a goal. And he wants to climb to the top of the mountain. And then as he's climbing, he decides, you know what? I'm tired. I'm too involved with other things. I'll let somebody else do it. And he doesn't finish the job. And the Kotzka Rebbe says, this is what the Pasuk is telling us. Be careful. Be careful if you're trying to climb the mountain. And then you stop on a Goya B'Katseo and you only touched it. Oy vey vey. Somebody who just touches the mountain and doesn't finish the goal, doesn't climb to the top, I don't even want to say, that's not what life is all about. And this is what Rabbi Shara was going to say. If you began climbing the mountain, don't be like those that are satisfied with a little bit. Go higher and higher. Believe me, Rabbi Isai, there are hundreds of children that could come to Nefesh, David. But Nefesh David doesn't have the funds to support all these kids that would love to come, whether it's France, Eretz Yisrael, United States, or Argentina, or wherever they may be. That's what we're here for tonight. We have to build Nefesh David, so not that they have 15 and 20 Talmudim, but that they have 120 Talmudim, because that's really what's out there. That's really what's out there. And this is the goal of Nefesh David. This is the goal of Toronto, to build Nefesh David, to make it a school so that the whole world will know about it. Not that the whole world will know about for 15, 20 Talmudim at a time. They can have 120 Talmudim at a time. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to accomplish tonight. To give as you never gave before. Because as Rabbi Gamliel Rabinovitz told me, and when I made a video today, I told it over at the video that's going to be on the Nefesh David website. There are certain yeshivas if they close, so the boys will go to other yeshivas. But if Nefesh David closes, chas v'shalom, these kids have no place else to go. And if that's the case, that's what our goal is. Now, the second thing that we have to learn tonight is midas toivis. You know why? Because I want to ask you something. You know, you're never allowed to say that a Gemara bothers you. You could say a Gemara puzzles you, or a Gemara is intriguing, but it's not nice to say that a Gemara bothers you. So I want to tell you about a Gemara that puzzled me for so many years. 24,000 Talmudim died? Why? Because they didn't give covet zeb zeh? Is that a reason to die? Because they didn't give honor one to the other? Wisdom me that connected me to everything that Hashem does is measure for measure. What's the measure for measure here? They didn't drive on Shabbos, they didn't eat Chazar, they didn't eat on Yom Kippur, they didn't kill anybody. What, what's the Midah connected Midah? And finally I found something. Listen to this and you'll see how true it is. The Maral in Yevom Samach Beis tells us, 
When you give COVID to your friend, that's the essence of life. Imagine you walked in here tonight and that one person said hello to you. A person could say, look, I must be nothing. I come to the hell or home, right? Everybody's here, everybody's choshev, nobody even looks at me. What, what, what am I living for? What am I? And that's why, that's what Rabbi Kakun was talking about. When you talk to Rabbi Kakun on the telephone, you need somebody, an interpreter, that operator. She's sitting, I don't know where she's sitting someplace. In Rochester, Chicago, Milwaukee, I don't know where she is. How many people ever thank her for the work that she's doing? You're talking to that other person. You've got to have an interpreter, right? Because that person is typing and she's telling you the words. Why don't you say thank you? Is there any person here tonight that I saw that I didn't ask their name? Not one. You know why? Because your name is very chashif to you. And when you ask somebody their name, you make them feel special. That's the essence of life. And I'll tell you something which is so amazing to me. We would think, okay, they didn't give COVID. But you know something? Even Rabbi Akiva, what Rabbi Akiva said, you take a look at the Medrash in, in Hayasara, you won't believe it. Rabbi Akiva did not give up. He saw 24,000 Talmudim died. He got five or six or seven, it depends what the Machlech is, different Talmudim. And you know what he said? He said, look, Rabbi Sai, we did wrong. We had Talmidim, Shehoyseinayim, Tzorah, Elo, Ba'elo, they were stingy, they were not caring for each other. So let's make sure. Arushayinim loy meisu, Elo, Shehoyseinayim, Tzorah, Elo, Ba'elo, Tenu da'atcham, Shehoy Tasu, Kamaseichem. Let's not do what they did. We got to teach Midas. We taught Torah, we didn't teach enough Midas. So again, it seems like small things, but you know something? The small things, that's what make people great. And I want to give you some examples of great people that did basically simple, small things, but that's what makes people great. I remember my father, Shalom, told me. Now, my father did not see me get married. My father passed away. I was only 21. I got married when I was 24. But my father always used to say, just remember, in marriage, it's not the big things. You can't buy a diamond every night. And you can't buy a car every night. You're not buying flowers every night, but it's the small things in marriage that build a relationship. And it's the small things in life that build a relationship. And that's what Rabbi Akiva was saying, that they shouldn't be ain of tzorah that they should give COVID one to the other. Let me tell you a story of Rabbi Gifter. Rabbi Mordechai Gifter, the Heilige Rosh Hashiv of Tells, right, who had the fire of Torah burning in him. He was once on a plane with, from LaGuardia, and he's going to, back to Cleveland with his Rebetzin, and there's a bochor from the yeshiva trying to get on the plane. He didn't have a reservation. Finally, they're just about to close the doors, and this kid gets on, he gets on a standby. The last person on the plane. Now, when Rav Gifta was still alive, they were still serving kosher meals on planes, if you remember what that looked like. Okay? So now they're flying to Cleveland, and in the middle of the plane ride, the stewardess comes and gives this bochor, gives him a kosher meal. So the Bachar says, excuse me, ma'am, it doesn't belong to me because I didn't even have a reservation on this flight. I just got on on standby. She says, I know, young man, but the rabbi said I should give you his meal. He said, the rabbi said I should take it? I can't. How can I take the rabbi's meal? He goes up to Rabbi Gifter, and he says to Rabbi Gifter, Rosh Shiva, I feel terrible. I don't want to take the Rosh Shiva's meal. So Rabbi Gifter smiles at him. He says, Junge Mann, ich will the episodes learnen. I want to teach you something. He said, I'm traveling with my Rebetzin. No matter how late I get to Cleveland, I'm getting supper tonight. <laughs> but you, when you get to the dormitory, the kitchen will have long been closed. You're not going to get supper. That's a Rosh Hashiva. That's Noya covered Zeb Zeb. I want to tell you something. It's so heartbreaking. I don't know if you know, I, I hope that all of you know, because I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but I'm sure most of you know that Rabbi Zachary Geli was Nifter, the Rav of Washington Heights. To me, every time I spoke to him and I spoke to his Rebbetzin, I saw the king and queen or the prince and princess of Klai Yisrael. Such royalty, such regalness. It, 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 it's just unbelievable. So yesterday I went to be Menachem Mobile. I was in Lakewood, and I was speaking with Rav Geli's children. So they told me some stories about him. I must tell you one or two of them. Just amazing. 
In Washington Heights, everything, of course, is yekish, and everything has a say there. So the Rav sits, the Rav, who's the Rav of the Gila, sits on the right side of the Aron Kodesh, and the assistant Rav sits on the left side. So Rav Breuer used to sit on the right side, Rav Schwab on the left side, and when Rav Schwab became the Rav, he moved to the right side. And when Rav Geli came, and he took over for Rav Schwab, really he should have been sitting on the right side. And they told him that Rav Schwab was ready to move. They said, ah, show him. I'm not going to take Rav Schwab's place. He's alive. I wouldn't dare sit there. It makes no difference if I'm the Rav. Okay. A few years later, Rav Schwab was nifter. Now, the fathers of the Kehillah came over to Rav, Rav Geli, and they said, okay, now the Rav, this Shabbos, will walk you over to the right side of the Aron Kodesh. He said, no, I can't sit there. I said, what do you mean? Didn't you say because Rav Schwab is here? He points to the Yezus Noshim. He says, you see, Rebetz and Schwab, she's coming tomorrow on Shabbos to Shul. She always comes. Imagine the pain when she'll see somebody sitting in her husband's place. And he wouldn't sit there until she passed away. Could you imagine? That's covered Zebazet. That's the small things. That's the ain't of Tzorah Zebazet. It's not the big things. It's the small things that we have to learn. And that's what the Bnei Yisoscha says. Why is the Sphira 49 days? Where does that come from? Why not 39? Why not 59? You know what he says? Because there's a mission in Ovech that says, Rabbi Yochanan Bazaka asked this Talmidim, what is the best meter to have? And each one said different things. Rabbi Lezim and Aruch said, Leiv Toiv. And he said, you're right. Because if you have a Leiv Toiv, then you're going to have all the other midas. Leiv is 32. Toiv is 17. 32 and 17 is 49. That's what we have to work on. We're coming towards Shavuos, Derech Eretz, Kod Molotayra. It's 49 days to have a Leiv Toiv. You want to hear a Leiv Toiv? Listen to this. Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel, right? The most beloved and the kindest. Every time I spoke to him, I started crying. I was, I, I, you just, to see that person, how he shook, and how he didn't want to take medication because he felt that it would affect his brain. And so he shook so violently, and it made him so weak, but his head was always there, his brain was always there. And he was just the most inspirational people, person, anybody who ever had a shaykh system knew that this is so true. So there was a young man whose wife was going through a difficult labor, and he called Rabbi Nassim Tzvi, the Rebbe said, answered the phone. And she said, how can we help you? And he says, please, ask the Rosh Hashiva to Davin. It was 10 o'clock at night. We're in the hospital. She's going through a difficult labor. And if the Rosh Hashiva could Davin, hopefully that the baby should be born soon, and it should go easy for my wife. Fine. During the night, the baby was born, and in the morning, when this young man got out of the hospital about 9 o'clock, he comes to tell the Rosh Hashiva the Psura Teva. As soon as he walks in, the Rosh Hashiva happened to be eating breakfast with his wife. He says, oh, Mazel Tov on the little girl. He says, Rosh Hashiva, did anybody call you? I didn't call you. How do you know that the baby was born? He said, 2 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep. I was worried about your wife. So we called the maternity ward in the hospital, and we found out that mother and baby were doing well. Then I could go back to sleep. Mazel Tov. COVID Did Rav Nassim Tzvi have to do that? No. But that's what greatness is all about. Greatness is in the small things that you do. I'll tell you two more things, and then we'll review and end with a fabulous, fabulous story. Because even little kids can do great things. I was at a bar mitzvah recently out of town. And the father of the bar mitzvah boy said, Rabbi Isai, nobody knows this story that I'm about to tell you about my son. And I was waiting to tell it when the whole family would be here. And he tells this story, that every day his son goes on a bus together with all the kids in the yeshiva. There's about 10 bus stops. So he said, my son got on the bus. And at the next stop, there were eight kids waiting to get on the bus. But there was a boy that my son was able to see through the big window of the bus that there was a kid down the block that was running to make the bus. So all the eight boys got on already. And the kid started yelling at the bus driver, wait a second, you know, there's another kid, he's running down the block, he's coming. The bus driver said, well, he should have been here on time, and he starts pulling away. Well, when that kid saw that the bus is pulling away, he started running faster, and he slipped, and he fell. When he fell, the next bus stop, 
the boy, the bar mitzvah boy, got off the bus and walked back to be with that kid who fell because he was so embarrassed and he was so hurt. And he didn't, walk that, he didn't want that that kid should have to walk to the yeshiva alone. And he started walking with him. The other boys on the bus saw this. They all run up to the bus driver and they say to the bus driver, you got to stop. you got to turn around the bus and you got to pick up both of those kids. And they made such a bahala that, of course, the bus driver had no choice. He made a right turn, a right turn, a right. He came around and he picked up those two kids. And the father said, I'm so proud of my son that he did that. And you know something? When I heard the story, I was so proud too. Because that little boy is my grandson. Uh-huh. Eliezer Crone from Waterbury. It's a small thing, right? But if a little kid could understand, that's covered. No, what should we learn? In our offices, in our homes, with our spouses, with our Talmidim, with our Chavrusas, with our co workers, the Yidden and the non Yidden? That's no, you covered, Zebazet. That's what, that's what Rabbi Yakiva's Talmidim were missing. I'll tell you one more thing, which I saw recently. I can't get over this. Rabbi Scheinberg was at a chupa, and they would, he asked if there's any white wine. And the caterer said they only had red wine. So Rabbi Scheinberg said, we have to get white wine. So one of the Talmidim said, Rebbe, there's like a whole crowd here. You're going to make the whole crowd wait till you get white wine? You know what Rabbi Scheinberg said to that bocher? You were never a kala before. You don't know what a kala worries about, that if they're going to have red wine at the chuppah and it spills on her dress, it's going to spoil her dress for the wedding. We're going to wait until they get white wine. It's the small things. That's what it's all about. So tonight we come here for Nefesh Dovid. We come Baruch Goyze Umakayim. They wish to make Xera that these children are hearing impaired Umakayim. But as the Skalena Rebbe taught us, he gave a kiyum. They could exist. Look at them. Look at their beautiful faces. Look at their happy faces. Whether it's Yisrael, wherever they come from, they come from all over the world. And we, tonight, by supporting, we can make this a goal that Rabbi Chaim Tzri should have a hundred Talmidim. He's had hundreds over the years, but he can have a yeshiva of a hundred Talmidim because that's how many kids there are around the world. And how do we meet goals in our own lives, as we said, like Rabbi Yerucham? Know your strengths. Believe in yourself. Remember the four Ds. And don't be satisfied that you only climbed part of the mountain. And let's remember the Yemei Asfira. We have to improve ourselves. How do we improve the Benod al to have that lave toy with the small things? Rav Gifter on the plane. Rav Nassim Tzvi with the telephone call. Rav Scheinberg with the wine. Rav Geli with the seat. These are small things. And are not Beruma Shaloylam. But that's covered Zebazah. That's how we have to change. And when you change in the small things, you'll change in the big things as well. You know Rav Baron is Akasha. And it's a great kasha. And I love the kasha because the teretz is even better than the kasha. Rabbi Aaron asks, imagine if the Rabbani Shlalem wanted to teach Klal Yisrael that we have to give COVID to each other, right? Why did he make them die in Sphira? They should have died in Elul. Imagine in Elul, Asheris Yemei Tshuva, Yaman and Roim, all the Rebbes and every, all the Rabbonim would give drushes. You see, the Talmudim died because Shalai Nogu Kavit Zebazev were going for a new year. Wouldn't that have been more inspirational if they died in Elul? He said, no, that's not what it's about. Those people who are only Talmud Chachomim, but don't have the Midas of Kavit Zebazev, they can't transmit Taira. They can't be our Rebbeim and our Rabbonim and our Rebbes. The Rebbes and the Rabbonim and the, those that are Mechanchim, they are great because they're in Torah and Derech Eretz. That's why they had to die before Kabbalah at Torah because they could not be the ones that were going to give over Torah to the next generation. So listen to this story. We'll see a story. It's just amazing. A few weeks ago, two families came over to me and they told me we want to tell you a story about a suicide door that just happened. A suicide door that just happened in Brooklyn. There were four families. They always get together every single year. They've been doing it for the last 10 years. They all go to Orlando together during the January break, the winter break. They rent a big house, 
and they have a private swimming pool, they have private arcades, and they're there for a few days. Fine. These four guys, they went to yeshiva together, they moved to the same neighborhoods, so they're very tight, these four. What happened was that one day, the women went out shopping, and the fathers were upstairs, either learning or doing whatever they were doing, and the kids were downstairs in the basement with the arcades. All of a sudden, one boy, this is stories being told at the Surah Saidah, one boy takes a look, and he sees a one-and-a-half-year-old kid is missing. And he sees that the door to the backyard is open and there's a swimming pool there. He runs outside and he sees that that little boy, that one and a half year old, he's face down in the swimming pool. And he can't do anything for him. He runs into the house. He starts yelling. It just happened to be Menashemayim that one of the fathers was coming downstairs to check on the kids. He happened to be an EMT. He happened to be at solo member. And this kid is yelling, there's a kid in the pool. The guy runs outside yanks this kid out of the pool, lays him down on a couch or on the floor, whatever, and he does CPR and he saves his life. And they called an ambulance and they saved his life. So the father, the father of this boy, whose life was saved, said, I want to give a curse a to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I want to give a curse a to to this Hatzalim member who was just there, just at that time. Just at that time. And he saved my child. That's why he made the Surah Saidah. He finishes speaking, and the wife of the Hatzalah member gets up to the surprise of everyone, and she says, now I want to speak. Imagine Libby Kakun came in right here now and said she wanted to speak, right? So what do you mean she's going to, she's, I have to tell something. She says, I want to tell you the other side of the story that nobody knows. She says, me and my husband, who was the Hatzalah fellow, this year we were not going to come. We couldn't afford it. We had a very difficult year in business. We didn't tell anybody, but somehow, somehow this father, he found out that we weren't gonna come. You know what he did? He called us up. He said, listen, nobody knows I'm calling you, but I'm telling you, you must come. You come every year. I am paying for you and your husband and your four children. So he paid this father paid for the Hatzalah guy to come and his whole family to come thinking that he was doing them the biggest favor. It turned out that he was doing himself the biggest favor because that Hatzalah guy was there, his son's life was saved. And that's what Chesed is all about. That's what Venosnu, the Balaturim says, Venosnu is a palindrome. You can read it frontwards and backwards. When you do Chesed and you give cover to others, others are going to give it to you as well. And I just want to end just with this Gemara. The Gemara tells us in Sukkah Mem Tessa Aleph. My Siv, what is it that which it says in Pasuk and Mishle, we know, of course, it's an Eshes Chayel. Pia Poschma V'chochma V'toyras Chesed Al Deshoyna. Toyras Chesed. What an expression that the Toyras Chesed. So the Gemara is Akashav Chi Yesh Toyra Shal Chesed V'yesh Toyra Sheino Shal Chesed. Of course, when you learn Toyra, it's the biggest Chesed in the world because the world exists because of Toyra. What does it mean, Toyra Sheino Shal Chesed? Zok de Gemara, according to one person, Torah la lambda. If you have Torah and you teach it to others, that's Torah shel chesed. But if somebody learns and they don't teach others, oy shaloy la lambda, ay ay ay, zuhi Torah she'ena shel chesed. If chas v'shom, somebody can learn and he doesn't make sure that others can learn as well, that's a Torah she'ena shel chesed. And that's what Rabbi Aaron writes again. The Torah Atzma, of course, is chesed. But if somebody knows, like the Talmudim of Rehra Akiva, and they didn't share with others, that's Torah She'en Eshel Chesed. We know that there are children around the world that are hearing impaired. Bor Hashem, our children are able to learn. But if we want to consider the Torah that we learn, Torah Shel Chesed, and not Torah She'en Eshel Chesed, we have to support Nefesh David and make sure that those kids are able to learn as well. That's what Torah Shel Chesed is all about. We come towards Shavuos, not only Torah, but the Chesed of Leif Toiv. Tonight, when we give the stock, it's not only for Limit Torah, but it's the greatest Chesed for those families that are struggling all over. And you know what Libby told me today? I couldn't get over it. She said, you know, there are some families that really, they should send their children, but they're embarrassed. But if we would only be able to have a bigger school 
and it would have even more prestige than it is, nobody would be embarrassed to send to Nefesh David. We would be able to have all those children that really need it. That's what we came here tonight. Give as you never gave before. And that chesed, your children and your grandchildren, and Mitzvah Shem, your great-grandchildren, were able to be Yireim and Shleimim and see Yiddish and Nachas Ad Bias Agoyel. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for listening. If you don't mind to take your seats for a minute again, I'd like to say something. <clears throat> uh, I'm not an orator, and I will take about two minutes.